Clementine by Sarah Penny Packer. Chapter 6. It's looking like we are on a school bus. Thursday morning, I woke up with a spectacular full idea. I'm lucky that way. Spectacular full ideas are always springing up in my brain. The secret thing I know about ideas is that once they spring into your head, you have to grab them fast or else they get bored and bounce away. So I called Margaret and told her I had a good surprise for her and we needed to sit in the back seat of the bus. It is unfair that sometimes even spectacular full ideas don't work out. It is also unfair that bus drivers are allowed to send you to the principal's office. Uh oh. It's not my fault, I explained to Principal Rice before she could say any of those Clementine, why did you use Margaret has very has very slippery head skin. Mrs. Rice fell into her chair hard. She clapped her hands over her ears and squeezed like her brains were trying to jump out. Part of me wanted to see see something like that, but most of me said, Not today, thanks. Margaret's slippery head skin is not the problem, she said. The problem is that you tried to glue your own hair onto Margaret's head. You've been having lots of problems this week. First, you cut off Margaret's hair. Then you colored her hair. Yesterday, you cut off your own hair and colored your own head. And today, this? Clementine, what's going on between you and Margaret? How do you spell nitrogen? I asked Mrs. Rice. Sometimes grown-ups get distracted if you ask them school things. But Mrs. Rice just spelled nitrogen for me and went right back to the Margaret thing. Are you angry with her? No, I said. Okay, fine. I yelled it. But I didn't know I was going to yell it, and I couldn't stop my yelling voice. Here is how good of a friend I am to Margaret. I'm not even mad at her for last week at my party, even though she breathed on the M&M rocks in the back of the dump truck which is the best part of the cake and then she sat on my sparkle glitter paint set which my was my bestest present and said it was an accident but I don't think so and now she's trying to look like me except she gets to have bracelets and I don't oh said Principal Rice, and then she didn't say anything at all. She just looked at me, which is the worst thing of all that can happen to you in the principal's office. I sat there swinging my legs back and forth like crazy for 300 hours, and then I said, Can I be done here now? And she said, Okay, fine. Margaret's mother let her come over to play after school. Does this mean she's all done being mad at me? I asked. No. She just doesn't think there's anything left for you to do to my head. Besides, she says I'm nine years old and I should be able to protect my own head. Then I told her some good news I had just thought up. I'm nine years old now, too. No, you're not. You're eight, she said. I came to your birthday party last week, which I remembered. No, I explained. I was eight at my party. Nine comes after eight, and it is after my party, so now I am nine, and that means we're the same age. That's ridiculous, yelled Margaret. I'm almost ten, and you're eight. You're, you are not nine. She tried to flip her hair, which didn't work so well without actual hair, and her head got even redder under the scrubbed-off marker. Yes, I am. I told her, I'm in the gifted class for math, so I understand about numbers. Then Margaret left and slammed my door. That Margaret, after all I've done for her, helping her fix her stupid hair. I followed her into the lobby and yelled, You shouldn't have breathed on my cake and sat on my present, and I don't want you to look like me. But she didn't even turn around, so now I had nobody to play with for the rest of my life. But I didn't care because I was nine. Or maybe I was just after eight. Okay, fine. Being after eight reminded me that I hadn't checked yet that day to see if I'd started growing a beard, so I ran to the bathroom. While I was there, I accidentally climbed onto the toilet seat to look out the window into the side alley to see if Margaret went out there. 
I didn't see her, but I didn't care, especially when I looked in the mirror and saw that I had started growing a nice brown beard on one cheek. Hey, Bill, I yelled. Bill is my dad's, for other people's name. Where's your razor? Dad came skidding into the bathroom so fast I thought his feet might be on fire, but they weren't. I showed him my beard. Dad squinted and sniffed my cheek. That's not a beard, Clementine, he said. That's chocolate frosting. As a matter of fact, that smells exactly like the kind of chocolate frosting that your mother put on the cake she made for her book club, which nobody was supposed to touch. Now, isn't that a coincidence? Okay, fine. I wiped off the frosting, and underneath was a very mad face. Clementine, my dad said, you know girls don't grow beards. What about that amazing bearded lady at the circus? What about that, huh? Clementine, I've told you a hundred times, you can't grow a beard. So Rutabaga gets to have one like yours someday, down to his knees if he wants, and I don't. That's not fair, which I have told him a hundred times. First of all, your brother's name isn't Rutabaga. Dad said, second of all, well, never mind. Maybe today isn't the time to talk about what's fair. My dad and I looked at my mad mirror face with green markered top for a long time. I sure am having a lot of trouble with hair these days, I whispered. I know, sport, Dad said. Then he hugged me. Usually this squeezes the mad right out of me, but that time it just mixed it all up with the feeling of sad and lucky which was extremely confusing. Hey, my dad said, have you got a little time to spare? I squint-eyed him. It depended. The Great Pigeon War, he said. It's time for evening maneuvers. I could use someone like you on the front lines tonight, someone with fresh ideas. I'm running a little low on them myself. I said okay, and my dad and I put on our raincoats and went outside. All right, they're having a pigeon war. What do you think that's going to be like? First, he got out the hose, which he calls the heavy artillery. Then he sprayed off the front steps and the sidewalk in the front in front of the lobby doors. Last, he pointed the hose at the pigeons covering the ledges of the window sills and balconies and roofs of the front of our building. He sprayed them until they all flew away. That's the best part. Because when a million pigeons take off at the same time right above you, you can feel their wing beats exploding inside you like fireworks. My dad handed me the hose. Want to clean the lion? Which of course I did. The carved lion above the front door has really pointy teeth. But I'm not afraid of him because he's using those teeth to protect us. Plus, he's just stone. I sprayed him with the hose until he was all shiny in the streetlights. You know, Dad, I pointed out, it's not really the pigeons you're at war with. The pigeons aren't the enemy. What are you talking about? He asked. It's my job to keep the entrance of the building looking nice, especially the entrance. You've seen what the pigeons do. Exactly, I said. The pigeons are fine. It's their mess you hate. Well, okay, that's true, my dad said. I'm actually at war with pigeon splat. You got any ideas on how to get rid of the pigeon splat without getting rid of the pigeons? How about diapers, I suggested. We could wait until all the pigeons are asleep, then sneak up and put little diapers on them. Brilliant, my dad cried. See, that's what I'm talking about. I can always count on you to see things from a new angle. I'm going to make you a captain. You made me a captain last week for the idea about charging them rent, I reminded him. You can be the sergeant then, he promised. Never mind, I said. Who would change all those diapers every day? Not me. Hmm, dad said. Excellent point. Back to the drawing board, sport. Then we just sat there, watching the pigeons walk back to our building for the night. We listened to them cooing above us, sounding like a million old ladies with secrets. What are we going to do? I asked. I mean, for real, 